Well, good evening and welcome to Lakeview. We are honored that you've joined us tonight. And uh, let me get the praise team to, you know what? Don't come up yet. I forgot. I got to do what I'm supposed to do. Let me just, let me just get my note out. All right. Uh, this is, uh, we welcome you to Lakeview tonight. Uh, if you are a new me- or, or a guest today, and some of you may be new members, we have Discover class today. So, um, but anyway, we have these cards in front of you in the pew racks, and uh, if you will, fill that out and place it in the offering plate later. There's a place on the back where we're honored to be able to pray for you each and every Tuesday um, as a staff, and so there are place, there's a place on that as well as if you're interested in anything at, at Lakeview, there's a place on the back you can fill that out. Um, let's take a few moments to begin the service and just welcome those people around you. All right, let's do that. All right, let's stand and welcome. Yeah. 
for the Lord God Almighty. five verse nine they sang a new song saying worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they shall reign on the earth Then I looked and heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea And all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Let's pray. Father, we join the inspired revelator John. 
and ascribing power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing to you, Lord, and to the Lamb who by his stripes was slain and by his blood ransomed a people for you, the living God, from every tribe, every language, every people and nation. Father, we represent that promise and fulfillment tonight. And we gather here tonight to celebrate our saving God. Father, thank you for sending the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. Thank you for sitting enthroned. and Thank you, Lord, for being our God tonight. And Lord, one of the ways that we, we demonstrate our gratitude We demonstrate our faith. We demonstrate the fact that we are a kingdom of priests is that we are generous. We are generous with our time. We're generous with our, our talents and our gifts. But we're generous as well with the monies you've entrusted to us. Father, may we be found faithful tonight as we come to this time of offering. Father, there's some till time to to give to Lottie Moon. We pray that those who have not given to Lottie Moon would give to Lottie Moon so that this fulfillment that we see here in Revelation 5 may come to completion as we resource our missionaries. And Father, we pray that this church, which is known for many years as a giving church, would grow, that we would grow in our giving as we grow in our understanding of your grace in Jesus Christ. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
stand together as we sing this last song before we hear a word, a message from God's word. Let's sing together. Jesus shall reign. Jesus shall reign wherever the sun does its successive journeys run. His kingdom stretch from shore to shore. Sun shall rise and set no more. Blessings about wherever he reigns, the prisoner leaves to lose his chains, the weary find. Back in our study of Genesis, so if you would turn to Genesis chapter 12, I'm always a bit uh, reflective on Super Bowl Sunday nights. Uh, I never saw uh, the first half of a Super Bowl, and I didn't like my dad for that, uh, but I can tell you today, I'm very grateful uh, that uh, he required us to be at church. Uh, we, we did not have family devotions. We only prayed at dinner. Uh, I don't remember the Bible ever being read in our home. I don't say that negatively. But the one thing my dad knew instinctively, and he got it right, is he scheduled our lives around church. And even when I strayed from the Lord, the church was in my DNA, and it was formed as a young person. So parents, you had your ch children, your youth up here singing. We had over 60 up here tonight. Well done. 
Well done. And you will see the fruit of that in time. Um, church life is being formed in their DNA. And it's going to be hard to get away from that when they become adults. And as we know, the Christian life is not an individual walk. It's a corporate walk. It's a corporate life. We have to spur one another on to good works, to persevere in the faith. Well, we're in Genesis chapter 12, and we're going to be just looking at three verses tonight. And so let's look at those three verses. Now, the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Let's pray. Father, we come to one of those pivotal passages. It kind of sets the program for the rest of the Bible. Father, we pray you would teach us tonight. Teach us about the gospel, even through these promises made to Abraham. Strengthen our faith, nourish our hope and love tonight. For you, through your son Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. So back in the 90s, I made several trips uh, to Seattle, Washington. And and I learned that uh, I always wanted to sit on the left side of the plane. And I would always be coming in from the east. And so if you're coming in from the east to Seattle, Washington, especially in the winter, you can expect to see dark, ominous rain clouds. But there, protruding through those dark, ominous rain clouds, so dark that you would often question whether you should have made that trip was a 14,400-foot snow-covered mountain peak of Mount Rainier. And in fact, it, it was those dark, ominous rain clouds, the backdrop of those clouds, that made that mountain look even more glorious. Well, we've been flying in some dark clouds in the book of Genesis, since Genesis chapter 3. And Genesis 12 is strategically located right after Genesis 3 to 11. And and Genesis 3 to 11 is significant and important for us to understand Genesis 12. Because in Genesis 3 to 11, Moses, under the inspiration of the Spirit, offers not just one but four pictures of humankind's rebellion against and hence alienation from God. And so in Genesis 1 and 2, uh, we have the pattern of God's ideal kingdom. And it describes the relationship between God and his image bearers and the creation as it was originally intended to be. But then we recognize it didn't stay that way for long. Four pictures are given to us to show us things are not the way they're supposed to be. And so in Genesis 3, we have what is known as the fall, though that word is not used there. uh, Maybe better said, a cosmic tragedy. Uh, But it is a fall. And, and, And that fall gives us Satan's playbook. And the reason he only has three plays in the playbook is because it works. It's like back in the day when you ran the wishbone. If you had a line that would block, a fullback that would would stick it up in the hole, and a quarterback that can run the option, it didn't matter if the defense knew the play. Well, Satan had three plays, and here's the three plays from Genesis 3. Did God really say? He has this questioning God's word. You will not surely die. He has this questioning whether there will really be a judgment, and you will be like God. Those are the three plays he's used since then. And the result is alienation from God. That's the first picture. The second picture we see in Genesis 4. And this shows uh, our alienation from God results in alienation from each other. We have the first murder, Cain murdering his brother. 
And then the third picture is the story of the flood. I was talking uh, to, to Peter Doyle before the service, and, and, and both of us recognized this is a universal flood. And, and it's universal, and, and it represents God's righteous judgment on an, an inc- a corrupt world. And then the fourth picture uh, is the story of the Tower of Babel. And it's the account of, of human sinners wishing themselves in the place of God, and the result of that was quite disastrous. The humankind is fragmented into different languages and nations. And yet, among these very people are the ancestors of Abram, through whom God will begin to do his work of redemption. Now, uh, this is the significance of Genesis 12. This is why this is one of the great mountain peaks of Scripture. Now, the tricky thing in in studying uh, Genesis 12 and following and studying Abram's life is that we need to hold two truths in tension or two realities in tension. First of all, Abram and his family will serve as examples of the struggle of faith. We're going to see that quite soon in Genesis. So they are examples of the struggle of faith in a fallen world. But then there's a bigger picture, a bigger picture that we have to always keep in mind that in a very real sense, Abram at this point in redemptive history is the hope of the world. And so those are the two things we have to keep in tension as we make our way through Genesis. Now we saw last time that the account of Abram, whose name would be changed to Abraham eventually, actually begins in Genesis 11 as God is preparing Abram for what he has called him to do. Uh, Not only that, more importantly perhaps, we have traced that seed of the woman uh, through Seth and, and, and Noah and Shem and Terah And now to Abraham. And that brings us, and we only have one point tonight. God's call on Abraham. Abraham's call and promise. And we see this in verses 1 to 3. Well, notice with me in verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. Now, before we get into the particulars, for those of you who weren't here the last time we were in Genesis, I want you to remember in chapter 11, verse 31, Terah, now that's Abram's father, took Abram his son and Lot the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son's Abram's wife, and they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. So they're on their way to Canaan. This is Terah leading the way as the, as the patriarch of this family. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. And so Terah and Abram and the family were on their way to Canaan and no reason is given. So there's no reason to speculate, but it's clear that Canaan is already on Abram's mind. Such is the impact of a father. But they never made it to Canaan. For some reason, we're, we're not told why they stopped in Haran. Yet the idea of going to Canaan was already planted in Abram's mind. And in some kind of unexpected way, God was preparing Abram for God's purposes and it started with his father who was clearly converted out of pagan moon worship. Now, why do I say it's clear? Well, later on in Genesis chapter 31, verse 53, Laban is negotiating with Jacob years later, many years later. And here's what he says. The God of Abraham... And the God of Nahor, the God of their father, that's Terah, 
judge between us. And so Abraham's God is Terah's God. So Terah has been converted, and through Terah's influence, a process has begun that would ultimately lead to Abram coming into the land. And what would have surprised Terah? And I pray every father here is surprised, gloriously surprised in some way, at what our sons and daughters will become and how God will use our sons and daughters. I don't give a flip how successful they are in the world. I want them to make impacts for Christ, right? And, and what would have surprised Tara? Um, with the exception of Jesus, I'm not sure that there's any more important figure in the Bible than Abram, Abraham. One indication of that is the amount of space given to him. So although there are only 11 chapters devoted to two plus thousand years of history, the war of the history preceding this passage, 14 chapters are going to be devoted to Abram's life in the book of Genesis. That tells us how important he is, as well as there are great sections of the New Testament that are committed to discussing Abram, Abraham. So for instance, Paul devotes an entire chapter of Romans, Romans chapter 4, to establish through the example of Abraham that justification comes by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. An entire chapter of Romans. Perhaps the most important book of the, of the Bible. How about Galatians? Paul devotes two chapters to Abraham to establish that salvation is not by works, but by grace. How about Hebrews? Hebrews 11, that great chapter on the heroes of the faith, the longest paragraph in Hebrews 11 is devoted to Abraham and his growth in his faith. Abram, Abraham is the only one in the Bible that is said three times was a friend of God. Second Chronicles 20, Isaiah 41, and James chapter 2. But his life would not come without sacrifice. Uh, notice, leave your country um, and your kindred, that is your people, and your father's house. Uh, I, I really didn't understand the emotions of that until I left Louisville. I knew God had called us here. But it was, it was deeply emotional, having established a life there for 19 years, having raised our children there. Uh, and, and this would have probably been even more emotional for, for Abram, the emotions and the kind of faith it took. But the call, to forsake all is very much like the call of the gospel. So for instance, in Mark chapter 8, verse 35, whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. That is the gospel call. And what we see in his personal sacrifice is nothing less than a new beginning for fallen humankind. It's important for us to remember that. So the Lord calls Abram to leave his country, to leave his people, to leave his family. But remember this. The Lord never calls us to abandon more than what he promises to give us. You cannot outgive the provision of God. Verse 2. I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And in him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And so, I hesitate to say this because it's going to sound like we're going to be here for another two hours. But... Be of good cheer. We're not. We're going to be out of here on time. But God promises him seven things here. 
By the way, I was at a chapel service one time and the pastor, the preacher said that his sermon had 35 points. I was ready to walk out at that moment. <laughs> but we will go through this quickly. <laughs> First of all, he says, I will show you a land. I'm going to show you a land. Um, now, the, this land, the land flowing with milk and honey, is intended to, to look back and to look forward. It, it, it's going to look back to the Garden of Eden. And so Israel, uh, the seed of Abraham, is going to function like a, like a macro atom. Showing what life under the government of God looks like in the garden, okay? As God is in the process of restoring what was lost. It's also going to point forward uh, to a day when the faithful inhabit the new heavens and the new earth. But I'm going to give you a land. The second promise, I will make you into a great nation. Now, Sometimes I will read something to you because I cannot say it any better. And, and in this particular case, Martin Luther, in his commentary, he says it as well as you can possibly say it, as he, uh, or says it by, when he considers how irrational this promise would have sounded to Abram at the time. He wrote it. This He said, you should consider that what the Lord promises Abraham here is altogether impossible, unbelievable, and untrue if you follow reason. Now, he's not saying it's unreasonable. He's saying our reason has fallen, right? If the Lord has something like this in mind for Abraham, why does he not let him remain in his land and with his kindred where Abraham undoubtedly has some influence or reputation? Is the way to success easier among strange people where one does not even have a place to set one's foot than at home where one's fields and friends and neighbors and relatives are, where one's household has been well established? In other words, Luther is saying, wouldn't it have been easier for God to fulfill these promises if he had stayed back in Ur? He was 75 years old, but Sarah was 10 years younger and barren at that. How, I ask you, do these facts agree with this promise? I will make of you a large nation. But where are the descendants to come from? Since Abraham's marriage is childless, he simply clings to this one thought. Behold, God is promising this. He will not deceive you even though you do not see the way. Amen? That's a good word. James Montgomery Boyce pictures it this way. Abram might have protested, but God, suppose I misunderstand your leading or get out of your will. I will make of you a great nation, says God. Suppose the time comes when my descendants become idolaters like those from whom I have come. Suppose they fall down and worship images made of gold. I will make you into a great nation. Suppose my people become so hardened against you that they crucify your son. God replies, I will make you into a great nation. The third promise here, I will bless you. I will bless you. Now, in Genesis 3 to 11, uh, we see and we have seen the shocking spread of sin five times in this chapter. Chapter 3 Verse 14, verse 17, chapter 4, verse 11, chapter 5, verse 29, and chapter 9, verse 25, we see the word curse. God's curse is pronounced on the creation and on sinners, which has really replaced the original blessing upon life in the garden. But now... God is beginning the process of recreating for himself a people by pronouncing a fivefold blessing here. And, and, and scholars are convinced that that fivefold blessing is intended uh, to communicate that he's reversing the curse through this man and his family. 
Again, James Montgomery Boyce. But suppose I stop at Haran and I, and I wait there until my father Tara dies. I will bless you. Suppose I find myself in Egypt and I'm so afraid the Egyptians will kill me in order to take Sarai that I tell her to lie and say she is my sister and suppose she is almost violated because of my cowardice. I will bless you. Suppose I am so distrustful of your promise to make me a nation that I take Sarai's servant Hagar as a concubine. I will bless you. This is the grace of God. Even in the midst of this promise, God knows what Abram's going to do. The fourth uh, promise here, I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. So what did the builders of the Tower of Babel seek to do? To make a name for themselves, right? That's what they intended to do to establish a lasting city and and make a name for themselves. Chapter 11, verse 4, and God promises to do that for Abram. Fifth and sixth, we bring these together. I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. In other words, Abraham's seed will be the conduit, the mediator of God's in time blessings and curses. It's established here. And this is going to become the theme of redemptive history. And then seventh, I will give your offspring a land, the land. At the time this promise was given, Abram had neither offspring and had a a wife who'd been young a long time, let's say. And he had neither land as well. And it's with this covenant that God sets up a principle, a very important principle. And you you will never move past this passage in this principle. He's going to set up a principle of mediation by which he will relate to all of humanity through Abram's offspring. You never get past this. And this promise is going to be progressively played out in Genesis throughout the rest of the Bible. And what I want to emphasize here as we come to a close tonight is the, pro- is the promise made to Abram is the DNA of the gospel that saved us all. In Galatians chapter 3, the apostle Paul is pondering these promises. Now, he's writing to a primarily Gentile church. Uh, a group known as the, Gen- uh, the Judaizers had infiltrated, and the Judaizers were saying, yeah, it, it's salvation by grace, but you've got to become a Jew. And, and so you've got to be circumcised, Uh, You've got to keep the Sabbath and on and on. You've got to become a Jew. In other words, it's salvation by grace, but then there's some some human works that you've got to throw in that. And Paul is establishing that salvation is all of grace. And here's what he says in Galatians 3 verse 8. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. By the way, this shows you that what Paul thought about God's word. It was God who promised that. And yet he's saying it's the scripture that said that. Uh, that he, God's word and scripture are the same thing to the apostle Paul. That's one of the reasons among many we hold to the inerrancy of scripture. Because If we can't trust what the Bible says about itself, we can't trust what it says about any other doctrine. And it claims its own perfections. In verse 9, so then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Paul is saying, no, you don't have to become a Jew. Even in Abraham's day, it was by grace through faith. And then in verse 16, one of the most important verses. Now, I want you to keep this in mind. This is a 
an, interpre- an interpretive principle. When you're, when you're studying the Old Testament, you always study a passage in light of the, of the revelation that has preceded it. All right? Always. That, that, in other words, you're coming to terms with what it would have meant to the original audience. But just like with any story, you don't fully understand that passage until you've read the last chapter. And, and in the New Testament, the, the apostles and Jesus himself are not, they don't, they don't lead us guessing, leave us guessing as to how to interpret the Old Testament. They teach us how to interpret the Old Testament. And they teach it through a Christocentric lens, which means that becomes the way by which we interpret the Old Testament. It's not that you're butchering the original context. It's just that every passage in the Old Testament finds its ultimate fulfillment. As Paul says, all the promises of God are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. That may be one of the clearest verses in the Bible. All the promises of God are yes and I'm in in Jesus Christ. He is the fulfillment. He's the telos. He's the end. Galatians 3.16. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. That's what Paul says. And notice what he says. It does not say and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one. And to your offspring, who is Christ. Do you see what he's saying here? He's saying that this, these promises made to Abraham in Genesis 12 are fulfilled not in offsprings, plural, but offspring, singular, in one person, the man, Jesus Christ. And so ultimately, it will be through the line of Abraham fulfilled in Jesus Christ that the so-called Gentile psalm will be sung by the nations. Psalm 117, praise the Lord, all nations. Extol him, all peoples, for great is his steadfast love toward us. And faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And that explains our presence here tonight. When the world is watching a football game, we have come in response to this command. But we come with gratitude and we come with love, recognizing God is faithful to his promises that began here, right here in this passage with with, with Abraham. And we come to praise him. You know, this afternoon in Discover Lakeview, I was standing in awe of the grace of God as I looked and saw so many um, prospective members from various nations who are coming, um, prospectively coming to join Lakeview because God has saved them. God has opened their eyes uh, to their need for the Savior. The one promised to Abraham so many centuries ago. And it caused me to stand in awe. The promise is being fulfilled before our very eyes. And we have seen that here at Lakeview. I remember 20 years ago, uh, we were having, we were having uh, baptisms week in and week out um, with, with new converts from Asia. And we're still seeing that today. Why? Not because we're so great. It's because God is great and he's faithful to the promise that we see here, beginning here with with Abraham. Through your seed, all the nations will be blessed. That seed is one man, Jesus Christ. And those who bless him will be blessed. Those who repent of their sins and bless him through faith will be blessed with forgiveness of sins and eternal life. And those who curse him by refusing to bend the knee, by refusing to worship him, by refusing to believe in his name, by refusing his provision for our sin at the cross, he will curse. 
That's the promise and fulfillment. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your mercy and grace to us. Thank you that you are a promise-keeping God. Thank you for the seed of Abraham, the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that everyone here tonight would believe in his name. For those who've already believed that their faith would grow stronger. Like the man in Mark 9, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. And for those who've not trusted in him, and there may be some here like that, that tonight would be the night they are converted to Jesus Christ and receive the blessing that is promised here in Genesis 12. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for worshiping with us today. If you felt the Lord leading you to respond today, whether that was to receive Christ for the first time or to take your next step in baptism, or if you have a prayer request, we want to start that conversation with you. Visit lakeviewbaptist.org slash contact to get in touch with one of our pastors. And as always, you can stay connected with us through our social media and website.